السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. Okay, it's going to take about two or three minutes. Okay, I want everybody that from the first to twelfth grade got to come up here, and everybody that's all the older people, anybody past high school, go in the back. Let's go. Sit right there, right in the front. Go. If you're against the wall, you can stay there. If you're against the wall, you can stay. On this side, but I want all the young people right in front of you. Everybody come up. All the young guys come up. Let's go. Sit, sit down. I'm talking to you. That's why. <laughs> I came here for you guys. From first to 12th grade. Yes. That's all right. Sit, sit, relax. Sit down. Okay, don't worry. Okay, guys, sit down now. All right, from first to twelve, anybody that graduated from high school, I did. Or if you didn't graduate from high school, but you're older than eighteen, go in the back. Okay. Alhamdulillah, he wahed up. والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله وبعد. I'm going to mention four different personalities. There are four different Muslim personalities that I'm going to mention. But the, before I start mentioning these four personalities, we live in a time period, brothers and sisters, that everything is upside down. Everything is in reverse. Qalbu al Everything is in reverse. And our Prophet alayhi salatu was salam and Abi Huraira ta radiallahu anhu qala sayyati ala nas sanawatun khadda'at yusaddaqu fiha al-kadib wa yukaddabu fiha al-sadiq wa yuktamanu al-kha'in the Prophet told us that there will be a time when the person that is that the liar, the, he will be the one that will be believed. And the one who is the, the one who is the truthful person will be considered to be the liar. And the individual that is trustworthy, he will be viewed as being a traitor or a deceiver. And in the one who is actually the um, the trustworthy in the uh, yeah, or then vice versa, the one who excuse me, the one who is the deceiver, he will be looked at the trustworthy person. And in the one who is a trustworthy person will be looked at as the one of the deceiver. And that's what we, we live in. We live during this time. Right now, what you even what you learn in school, what you see on TV, when you walk in the streets, they're changing everything around. Good is bad, and bad is good. Why am I mentioning that? It's just like the magic. فَإِذَا حِبَالُهُمْ وَعِسِيُّهُمْ يُخَيَّلُوا إِلَيْهِ مِنْ سِحْرِهِمْ أَنَّهَا تَسْعَى We know even in the Qur'an when Musa alayhi salatu wa salam when he challenged the magicians and when they, when they threw their, their ropes and their sticks it uh, looked like to Musa that they were moving. 
This is the type of time period that we live in. And we're faced with this. We're challenged. Because Shaitan, he has two weapons. He has two weapons that he uses. Yastadu bihima atnas. Shaitan, what? He hunts you with these two weapons. The first one is Shubuhat, and the other one is Shahawat. The first one is that he tries to cause some type of doubt or problems in your beliefs. And then the other one is what? No, your desires, things that you like. He tries to lure you with these two things. Beliefs by corrupting your beliefs or calling you to what? That which you desire. And this is what we're faced with all the time. Now the reason why I brought this up because of the title of this small little lecture, which is um, the challenges of street culture, right? Let me tell you why it's a challenge, guys. For all you older brothers that especially came over to America, you don't have this challenge. You don't have the challenge of street culture. All the little guys do. Before me and his brother accepted Islam, we had this challenge. You know why? It's because in this society, street culture is glorified. What is bad is good. When you go to school and you say, oh, I'm a virgin, that's bad. Oh, what are you, a faggot? <laughs> you don't mess with girls? What's wrong? What, what, what's, like, you don't mess with girls? That's, that's insane. Okay? That's, that's insane. Because what is bad is glorified and made to be good. And what is uh, um, and what is bad is made to be good, and what is good is made to be bad. This is the reality. And this is what we're challenged with. You don't steal. You don't do credit card scams. You're not in a gang. You don't got a girlfriend. You don't got a boyfriend. What? What's, what's wrong with you? It's, 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 are you kidding? You don't sell drugs? Come on, man. Are you a human being? Yeah. But, th that, but that's, that's what's happening. Everything is vice versa. Let me tell you something. Many people, they have their little stereotype of African Americans. Take this stereotype away. What you see now from a small group of us did not exist until the 1960s. It didn't exist before the 1960s. In this country, the people who were gangsters and criminals were the European immigrants that came over. Even when you looked during the after slavery, early, I mean, late 1800s, 1900s, the um, posses and renegades, they, they were white people. All those, those uh, posses and the uh, um, Billy the Kid and all of them, they were white people. So what you see from the African American culture or the people, this is something new. This didn't even exist during my grandmother's time. It happened around the 1960s. And you know when it started? And many of you, probably no one in this room is going to know what I'm talking about except for this brother right here. Not even this brother over here. His father would know. Around in the 1960s or maybe late 60s, early 70s, there was a movie that came out that was called Superfly. Superfly. And it was about a man that was a pimp. And he, don't worry about it. Because you're not going to be one. All right? Just hear the word. Right? The older people, they wouldn't know. Man, you yeah, you tag you to yourself. Okay? So this one, this movie, 
they glorified being a pimp. So what happened? Black people now, because of poverty, now they started to want to go in this direction. Then they started glorifying drug dealers. Some of you, none of you know about New Jack City. This is the movie, uh, Scarface. Okay? The movie Scarface, New Jack City. All of this stuff that you see, this street culture, this so-called challenge that you're being challenged with, it was all created through the media. It was created on TV. And they glorified it to make it where for a certain group of people, it looked like it was good. Many of you look at rappers, right? You know all the rappers, right? Now the brother Muhammad, he asked you, do y'all know about Queensbridge Projects? The projects, I'm from, I'm really from, let me see. My, when my mother had me, they brought me to Corona, and then I lived in Ravenswood, then I moved to Queensbridge. I went back and forth, okay? So, but I grew up a lot of my life in Queensbridge projects. My father lived in Queensbridge. My mother lived in Ravenswood. Now, the project where we come from is known throughout the whole world. We produce the most rappers or from the best rappers in the whole world. Matter of fact, the best rapper of all time, as they say, is who? Nas. He's my age. He grew up with me. Now, when I was coming up, you became a rapper. Being a rapper was a loser. Y'all don't know that. Being a rapper, you were a loser. That means you couldn't, you, you failed in two things. You failed either being a basketball player or athlete, or you failed being a drug dealer. If you, didn't, if you failed as a drug dealer, or you failed as an athlete, then you rap. That's what happened. And now these people, these rappers, are leading the culture that you guys are following. This is what the culture that you guys are following. Come on. Pay attention. This is very important. Okay? This is, the, this is the culture culture that you guys are following. It shouldn't even be a challenge for you. It shouldn't even be a challenge because it's nedges. The religion of Islam, I can tell you the meaning of Islam in one word. Anybody can tell me that one word? In Arabic or English? I can, you can su sum up the word Islam the religion of Islam, the whole religion of Islam, sum it up in one word. You said peace? Submission? The whole religion. Anybody? Tahara. Yeah, it's Tahara. Purity. The whole religion of Islam calls to purity of your aqidah, your beliefs, which is in your heart, your bedding, your body, even your lisan, your tongue. And the Prophet didn't speak. He didn't use bad words. He had good character. He had clean, pure, clean character. He had clean speech. His heart was clean. His surrounding. Wahidina ila Ibrahim wa Ismail and Tahira Bayti ila Tahirin wa Al-Aqibin wa Rukis to do. Allah told them to clean their surrounding. So even our surroundings are clean. Al Marbu ala Deen Khalili. Fayandur ila man yukhalim. That the person is on the religion of his. Companion. So even your friend should be clean. Everything, the whole Islam calls to purity. Everything besides Islam is what? 
نجس يا ايها الذين امنوا انما المشركون نجس If I touch a kafir right now, or if I touch a kafir right now, just touch him. I don't gotta go make wudu. I don't gotta wash my hand. His najasa is his belief, his behavior, his surroundings, and najis. So this street culture is najis. The same way that you see Al-Ghaid with bowel, with feces in the urine, the same way that you consider that to be filthy and nasty, is the same way you got to look at the street culture. You don't want to touch it. It's nasty. And if it gets on you, you need to clean it right away. If you get some pee-pee on you, what you going to do? Shower. Right? Would you like somebody to spread, put more pee-pee on you? No, right? It's nasty, right? It's the same as street culture. It's disgusting. It's nasty. It's disgusting and it is nasty. So let me give you some examples of four different personalities. And tell me which one you are. The first personality is this guy right here. When I first met, I met him two times. I met him two times. The first time, he was a Kafir and I was a Muslim. No, both times, I think, right? He was Muslim the second time? Okay. He was a Kafir the first time, and I was a Muslim. And then the second time, we were both Muslims. The first time I met him, yeah, I want a mother. No. No. So the first time I met him, he wasn't Muslim. I was Muslim. I just finished making salah. I was a new Muslim. And I'm going to go and tell you about my personality. Okay? Because it's a little different than his story. But I want to make a continuation from him to my other, the four personalities. So when I first, I, I was in the masjid. I might have been a Muslim maybe one, two, three years. I'm not sure. So we just finished making salah. It was during the day. I don't know if it was Bukhur or the Asr. And when I came out the masjid, now in Queens, the blocks are very long. So the masjid is at one corner. And when I came out, I started walking towards the other end of the block. Because I was going to go to uh, the, the, one of the public schools to go play some basketball. So as I'm, when I came out, as I'm walking, I seen two young men and a brother, an Egyptian brother, he didn't have any beard on his face, he didn't even look like a Muslim, and he had a briefcase. And as he was walking towards the masjid, I'm coming, I'm coming this way. He's coming this way, but he's all the way down the block. I see these two youths, and they come, and one ran like real fast, and he closed mine the brother, and knocked the, the brother hit the ground, his body bounced up, and he started running full speed towards the master. So I went, I walked to the master real quick. I said, brothers, one of the brothers got attacked. Let's go take care of the, let's go take care of the situation. Now I'm a new Muslim, and as y'all, when y'all know about my story, you're gonna know why. So at that time, I'm still in the slam, you know, I still got, I'm still rough around the edges, okay? So I still got some of the street stuff with me. So I, I had a weapon on me. So as we walk in, right? So I told the brothers, come on, let's go. So like maybe one or two brothers uh, came with me. So we went. I seen some young people. I was like, yo, one of y'all hit. Uh, one of y'all responsible for hitting the brother and I pulled out my weapon and I was going to do something. This is wrong. I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you the story. Okay? Now the police came. So a whole bunch of the police came and then now there was a whole bunch of brothers and there was only a few of them that was talking to one of the kids he was like, please don't do that to me. My, my grandfather's an imam. 
So when the police, the, a police officer, he took me to the side. He said, I know how your Muslims get down. i see y'all later. And the police left and let us do what we want to do. <laughs> we didn't end up doing anything because the, the, what, the, the, the individuals who hit him, they got away. Now, what's so ironic was one day, me and the brother Abu Issa was talking, and he said, Khalil, I want to tell you something. Do you remember that there was an incident when a brother was walking and some guys tried to rob him and so on and so forth? I said, yeah. He said, yo, that was me. That was him. He was one of the guys. So we almost faced each other. I'm Muslim. He's now Muslim. We almost faced off. At that time, what? We were enemies. So Allah tells you that remember the ni'mah, the blessing of Allah, how you were enemies, and Allah gathered your hearts together. So the, ne so the next time we met, which I didn't, when we met the second time, I didn't know about that previous incident. This, he told me that years later. So when he told me that, so when I, I used to go with the brother Abdul Baki, and I forgot who else we used to go, and we used to go visit the uh, juvenile detention center. Uh, uh, Abu Kutub, yeah, that's right. And we used to go visit the juvenile uh, detention uh, uh, facilities where the young men are, are in prison. So when I was, when I came, I'm a Muslim now, and we gave a little speech, we gave a little talk, we was giving dawah, and this young man came up to me, he had these little braids in his hair, and I had mentioned in my talk that I was from Queensbridge Projects, and he was like, yo, I'm from Queensbridge too, and I said to myself, no, you ain't, because I ain't never seen you before. <laughs> And he was like, you know, uh, uh, he's Muslim and so on and so forth. He was this brother. I met him also when he was locked up in jail. But at that time, he was a Muslim. And then when he came home from prison, we became like this. We were very close. We were very, very, very close. So at one time, even though Allah saved both of us, because one of us might have got hurt. God said he could fight. I never lost a fight either, but we don't know what would happen that day. Right? <laughs> you know? We don't know what would happen. Right? And I'm Muslim. He wasn't. We were a dad. We were enemies. We met. And then the next time we were what? Ikhwa. We were brothers. So we have it where this person is going from being a gang leader to now being a Muslim. And not only did he become a Muslim, then he became Multezim. He became a devoted Muslim. And not only did he become Multezim, but then he also became Falabu and He also went and he studied. And he graduated from one of the Islamic universities. So now let's go to me because I want to connect both of our stories with one eye. As for me, I come from a very privileged home. If you were listening to when the brother gave my my nebda, he gave my little brief biography about me. He said that I am an imam chaplain at a hospital called the Henry J. Carter Specialty Hospital. My name is Khalil Henry Carter. The hospital is named after my father, who's not a Muslim, may Allah guide him. I mean, I come from a privileged situation. I come from a situation where my father is, was very well known. He was a senior vice president of a bank. He has one of the top charity organizations in the United States. My father has the largest Nike contract. 
How many guys got a pair of Nike sneakers? Air Jordans. Oh. Nice. My father is the one who brought Nike to the East Coast. My father did that. Nike first came to the East Coast to my dad. So I come from a privileged home. I never went to private school. I mean, public school. I only went for six months. Because I'll get to that point. I went to Catholic school from first to eighth grade. And from ninth to twelfth, except for six months, I went to a, a Catholic high school. So I was privileged. I went to private school. Any sneakers that I had, I had because of my father's contract, any Nike sneakers that came out, I had them before they came out in the stores. This is the lifestyle I grew up in. I ate with anybody that you can imagine as an athlete, especially ball players, coaches that were famous. I, I met them personally. I met the Martin Luther King family. I ate dinner with their family. This is the type of lifestyle. I grew up around millionaires and billionaires because these are the people who donate to my father's organization, which is called Wheelchair Charities. But guess what, guys? I went through a phase in life because all of us, we go through marahim. We go through different stages in life. Everybody. First, we go through the stage of what? Adam. There was a time we didn't exist. Then we, uh, then we were in people. Then we were in the bellies of our mother. Then we were what? We went to Tufula. We were children. And then we're going to go to Murahaka which is adolescence. Then you're going to go to the next marhala, which is Shababa, where you become a young adult. Then that's up into 40 years of age. And then you're going to become, then from four you go through Kumula, where you go through that uh, middle uh, middle age, and then you go to Shekhocha, the elderly age at 50, and then after that everything goes downhill. There's nothing else after that except for death. You go through stages. Just like the, the, the moon goes through stages, human, go, human beings go through the same exact stage. Start off as a crescent moon, small, gets bigger, 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 full moon, and then it starts to get smaller again, smaller, and then it disappears. You're gone. That's your life. So when I get to around the Murahaba, the adolescence. During that stage, you go through a stage where now you start searching to see who you are. You go through like an identity crisis. And I had a serious identity crisis. The identity crisis that I had was that my father was famous, popular, and people only knew me as being his son. And I wanted my own shaksia. I wanted my own personality. So because I wanted that, uh, that personality, where I lived at, I went through the challenge of street culture. Because I got attracted or caught up with what was being glorified at that time. Now, I played basketball. I played Division I basketball. I had a full scholarship. I went to an all-black school. My, right? I played against some of the major colleges. I was a starting point guard. I was the second best point guard in my division, the MIA. When I was in high school, my our division was the number one high school division in the whole United States at that time. So I played ball. But things wasn't going the way I wanted it to go, or I expected it to go. So I told y'all, at my, during my era, and in our community, two ways of success. Playing, you're an athlete or you sell drugs. Okay? And I definitely wasn't going to be a rapper because I can't, can't, I can't sing and I can't dance. Okay? If I was a dance teacher, I'd step all over your feet. Okay? But 
So what did I do? For me to get this identity, to get this, to get this, to be accepted or, you know, for people to be recognized. I wanted to be recognized. You guys thought they wanted to be recognized. I end up going the wrong way. And I end up being in the streets. I started at four, around 14 years of age. I tried it for the first time. I was a little scared. I left it alone. And I came back and I started again at 16. I didn't have to. I came from a privileged family. But I was going through identity crisis. And I didn't get the right cure. To die well, well, and to die well, been haram. The Prophet Sallallahu told us, take medicine. When you're sick, take medicine. But he said, don't take the medicine that is haram. And for me to cure the, the problem that I was going through as an adolescent, I took the wrong medicine. But I didn't know about Islam. I didn't know about Islam at that time. And I had Muslims that were around me. But they were they what? I didn't know they were Muslims. Number one, no one ever called me to be a Muslim. And there was nothing from them that I seen that was Islam. How many people here in your school know that you're Muslim? Raise your hand. They know that you're Muslim. How do they know that you're Muslim? Tell me how they know you're Muslim. Because you told them? Because you told them, you told them there's nothing that, what else did they see from you that was Islam? Because they're saying I'm Muslim, that's not Islam. What did they, see? how about you? How do they know you're Muslim? Yeah. Oh, they seen you pray? You pray in school? Oh, it's a private school. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about the public school. No. I want, I'm talking about the public school guys. The public school. Who's in public school? How many of you guys pray in public school? You pray in public school? No, I was talking about you. Oh, me? Yeah. I could, but I only play at recess, so... Yeah. But you pray in school, though. Yeah, we could. But do you? Me? I did two times. Come on, you're taking me around, man. Let's come straight forward. I can. Say it words yeah. straight to the point. Yes, I prayed in school. You, oh, you prayed. Okay. We're doing about five times a day. If your children are praying, guys, shame on you, parents. Shame on you. Now, I'm going to read for you a person that the, the, what the, another personality. It's the second personality. And I'm going to go back to our personality. This is from a book. Um, this is from a book that was written in 1847 by a Christian priest here in America. He wrote this in 1847. Okay, now tell me if this is you. He says here, in the year 1806, on the arrival of a slaver from the coast of Africa, Gay Dorothy went to the city of Savannah, Savannah, Georgia. That's like, you know, southern uh, Georgia, close to Florida, to buy slaves. After several hundred had been sold in lots and singles, in groups and singles, as soon as the purchases, a middle-aged man was put upon the stand. He was brought... Right? There was a stand because now they're bringing the slaves over and they're selling them. So they brought him up, this middle aged man. Who wished to make a communication before he was sold. Look at this man. So before they sold him, he said, I got, he, he, there's something that he wants to tell them. There's something I got to tell you. The purport, the, um, the purport of which was that he was a Muhammadan. He wanted to tell them, I'm a Muslim. This is during slavery. He said, I'm a Muslim. 
and that whenever the hour of prayer and other devotional duties came, he must have time to attend them. You should be ashamed of yourselves. How many of you, when you went to your job, you went to human resources, and you told them, I'm a Muslim and I need to pray, or when you was on that job interview? Yeah. How many of you, when you brought your children to school, to the public school, and you told them, my children are Muslim, and these are the times they have to pray, and the summertime is like this, and the winter time is like this. So when they're here, if it's the winter time because the times of the prayer is shorter, they got to pray because they can't miss the prayer. And we need a place to hunt the water bottle. They need a place to go and pray. How many of you parents did that? Yeah, Ali Mu. The prophet commands us. Ali Mu as Sabi. Ali Mu as Sabi as Salah. Ibn Seven. He commanded, teach your children about the prayer at seven. Wadribuhum alayha ibn Ash. And if they're not, then you discipline them when they're ten. Shame on you. When you took your children, your boys and your girls, to the school, look at this slave. During this time, they're killing you. You in America? Why you come to? We we in America, so-called freedom of religion. Why are you not exercising your rights? Why are you not exercising your rights? So now your children, you should. Establish to the principal, my child is a Muslim, or when you go to your job, then look, I got to make prayer. So look at this slave here. So he communicated to them. So then it says here, So Mr. D, Mr. Uh, Dorothy, who had lately embraced religion, meaning he became this 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 slave owner, slave owner, he now became more of a devoted practicing Christian, and seemed to be zealous to promote the cause, gave the highest price for him. So this devoted Christian, he gave the highest price for this Muslim, gave the highest price for him. Feeling confident within himself that he would soon convert him to the true faith, meaning the Christianity. <clears throat> Brothers, let me tell you something. When you migrated to America, they didn't want you. They want your children. They want these little young children. They want your children to leave this land. They don't want you. They know they can't get you. You've been Muslim too long. But they want your children. They, they have you come over here. You work. Your wife work. And then your children is left to who? To them. And they have to now go through this challenge. Let me tell you. The, the title of this is called The Challenge of Street Culture. The challenge of school is worse than the streets. The challenges that they have to go through in the schools is even worse than the streets. Let me tell you the let me tell you the worst, let me tell you the worst book out, the worst spots in the United States. Guess where it's at? College. The college campus. It's the worst and most evilest place in this whole country. On campus. When you stay on the campus, a bunch of young kids without any supervision, no parents, freedom, could do as they want. You don't even understand the things that go. Some of you even send your daughters away to colleges to go away to campuses, to other states. 
What's in your mind? What is on your mind? What are you doing? You send your sons away. You don't even know what goes on on, on the campus because you've never been to college yet. But if you know what, what is happening on these, in this campus, in these dormitories, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I went to college. I know what goes on. And let me tell you, the more prestigious that the school is, the worse it is. I went to a black college first. They have rules and regulations, and the white colleges have no rules. We have people that even go to school, stay with us on campus the whole semester, slept in our rooms. Any drugs that you, that you want on the campus. Anything that you imagine goes on on the college campus. Bunch of kids. And this is where you send your children. Okay. So then, he says here, so he wanted to uh, convert him to the true faith, which he thought they think is the true faith. Taking him to his plantation, he built him a hut and, ass and assured him that he would that he should be allowed the time he required. So he said, yeah, I'm going to give you this time for you to pray. And in addition, should have every opportunity to attend all the meetings of the Christians. So he wanted them to come to the Christian meetings. Now that's the school. Because you don't know what they, these schools, what they teach these kids in the school. Okay? And even on the streets. The Mohammedan slave for a while attended these meetings and learned something of Christianity without, however, discontinuing his former devotion. At the expiration of about a year, his master, who was intent on conversion, asked him formally if he did not prefer Christianity to Mohammedism and if he would not openly renounce the prophet, they know about the prophet Muhammad, and acknowledge Jesus Christ. Look, like he's trying to convert him. Like they're trying to convert your children in the school, the things that they teach them. They, 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 they don't directly teach your children Christianity, but they teach your children about evo the, the theory of evolution. Make your children into atheists. When well, they don't believe in God, and tell them that it's okay if you it's okay you know if you, you know you can be like this and this you're you know you know what I'm talking about these kids here. So then, right, the slave acts. If the Christian religion allowed one Christian to hold another in slavery and their children after them, the answer, of course, was in the affirmative. The Mohammedan, meaning the Muslim, replied that the religion of the prophet did not allow that. The result of all was this, this slave in a land of the Bibles and gospel ministry. Look how strong he was. Look how strong this Muslim was. And the first thing that he wanted to establish is that I got to pray. That's the first thing for me to be able to make my salah. The result of, of so the here in the uh, now of the Bible and gospel ministry daily said he daily he said his prayers perform ablution he made wudu made his prostration meaning salah and at an advanced age died declaring that God was one and that Muhammad was his prophet. One of the shiuk, his name was, was Safwa Nur al Egyptian sheikh. I don't know if you remember meeting him. He came to America. When I was studying in Egypt, because I studied there, I went back and forth for five years. And then afterwards, I uh, um, continued my education. I graduated from Mishka University. I got my bachelor's from them. And then I worked on my last semester working on my master's. So I had five, I had five years of study in Egypt, an additional in the university center. I had a traditional, five years traditional, and 
and now seven years of the university setting. When he came to Egypt and he came to our area, to our camp, he told the Egyptians, he said, look, in America, by the third generation, Islam is gone. The parents, the grandparents are Muslim. Islam gets weak with the children. And by the grandparents, Islam is gone. It's just a name. If you get caught up with this street culture and you glorify it because it's deception, they make, they make something that's bad to be good. Now the last two, because I'm just, they, they gave me this five minutes, I don't think it's fair. I don't think I get my point. But anyhow, <laughs> real quick, two Muslims that I know. One, he was born in Islam. You know where he's at now? He's dead. He got his brains blown out. What? Yeah. Wow. Because he got attracted to the street culture. And he started hanging out in the streets. He started selling drugs. And one time, uh, he got beat up real bad. I was actually there. This is after we had a shootout with, some, with our rivals. The next year, I became a Muslim. When I became a Muslim, I went to him. I said, yo, I'm a Muslim now. Let's me and you practice Islam together. You were born Muslim. You know the whole last Jews, the last part of the Quran. You teach me. You be my teacher. And let's stay together and leave the street life alone. He didn't listen. The next time I seen him, he has staples in his head because somebody took a razor blade and cut his head wide open. Then the next time I went to visit the projects, I used to go back to our neighborhood to call people to Islam. And you know what happened? Somebody said that he was killed. Then the other personality is a Muslim that we were in the gang, we were, I mean, excuse me, we were rivals against each other. We used to have shootouts against each other. I became Muslim first. Then he became Muslim. Then we started being together every day. But what happened was, and his brother, anybody know the, the rap group called Mob Deep? Mob Deep, what a famous, everybody know Prodigy, he just died, he's a famous rapper. Havoc is his brother. You go on the internet, and his name is... Okay. <laughs> Havoc is his brother from Mob D. Very famous rapper. They, down, they used to be down with 50, 50 Cent. Okay, yeah, everybody know 50 Cent now. But Havoc, very funny. The, the, the uh, song Shook One, Scared to Death, Scared to Look. You know that one? Okay, that's like a theme song for the streets. That's his brother. His nickname is Killer Black. You go on the internet, look up the uh, biography of Killer Black is on there. His name was, he became Abu Jabal. We was together every day. But you know what? He, his mother wasn't happy that he was Muslim. He couldn't deal with the temptation of his brother's fame, the pressure from his family, the pressure from the streets, and guess what? We stopped, we stopped hanging out with him. So I seen him again, because he disappeared for a while. I was like, listen, man, where you been at? He said, excuse me. You know, I got caught up in the streets with the girls, and, you know, I don't think, you know, I can really, you know, practice Islam because I said, no, man, no. You gonna, you gonna come back and hang out with me? We're going to stay together. We're going to pray go to the master. He said, I can't be around. I said, listen, I'm not even going to allow you to do that stuff. He's like, nah, I can't do it. He got caught up with this. He, he, but he got drowned by his life. He started hanging out with his brother more and more. So when I seen him a second time after that, somebody had just cut him in the eye with a razor blade. And then I was like, listen, man, this is a sign for you, man. Come on, come back to Islam. Leave the street life, leave the street culture alone. He ain't listen. The next time I went out to the neighborhood, somebody said, no, matter of fact, we got my job. 
And somebody that was from our same neighborhood said, yo, did you hear what happened to Killer Black? I said, no. They said he took a gun and he shot himself in the head. He was taking, he, somebody said that, somebody put something in his, mar his, his drug, the marijuana, or they said he was drinking, and the last thing he would say, I can't take it no more, I can't take it no more. Because whoever goes away from the dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah, his chest becomes tight. His chest becomes tight. You can't take it. Because it's, it's nedges. It's just like if you have some feces in front of you, the smell is bad. It's going to bother you. That lifestyle, it bothers you. It's no good. You can't live with it. You might look at the cap and they might look happy, but they're miserable. We would we were disbelievers. We know we were miserable. Until we couldn't take it anymore. And we left and we and we accepted Islam. Now, brothers, let me tell you, young guys, if you don't want the deen, guess what? What in Tetawando? If you don't want the Islam, Allah will replace you. And He will bring a people that what? Will take they will not be like you. Yeah, if you turn away from your religion, then Allah will bring a people that he knows in their heart that they're going to love him. And he loves them, and they will replace you. Look at it right now. Who's talking to you right now? A reverse. Someone who was a disbeliever, and a, because really, I'm supposed to be sitting there, and someone who's born in Islam... And, and study the religion is supposed to be teaching me. It's supposed to be teaching us. But the places were switched. The places were switched. How many people was a hafid in this masjid? Who's a hafid there? You know, he's a hafid. His father was a kafir. I know his father. He's the only hafid in here. Oh, there's another one. Who else? Right there? Raise your hand. Masha Allah. Fatah Allah Ali. But look, this one, his father was a Mushrik Kafir. Like me. Allah made a Muslim and then gave him a child that now is Hafid, leading other people that's what? In the Salah. That were born into Islam. Allah will switch you because he doesn't need you. He has no needs for you. If you don't want to do the job, Allah knows the heart, and he will bring that person that will do the job. If you don't want to pray, Allah will bring somebody to pray. You don't want to fast, Allah will bring somebody to fast. You don't want to fast, I mean, you don't want to make hajj, Allah will bring someone to make hajj. If you don't want to give zakat, Allah will bring someone to give zakat. You don't want to memorize the Quran, Allah will bring someone to memorize the Quran. That's the Catholic. I'm going to tell you real quick. This is my five minutes, right? Look, give me three. <laughs> Look how me and Fuji, Fuji, the one the one I told you he got killed, I'm coming to him. I'm giving him dollar now. One more. When I was in college, because when my first introduction to Islam was how? I was in the streets, doing stuff I had no business doing, and I got jumped. And because of who my father was, he knew some Muslims. And some people who said they were Muslims. And they came to take care of the business. I was upset because I wanted to take care of my own situation. But Alhamdulillah, Allah saved me because you wouldn't see me right now. I'd be doing 25 years in jail. So that was my first introduction to Islam. So I asked one of the Muslims, I'm like, like, what religion are you? And I already had left Christianity. Now let me tell you, 
right before that, I was, you, you said we have six blocks. I was on one, on my block. I got drugs in my hand. And I, my, the reason why I chose the name Khalil, because I said, all oh my friends, that's how I used to call, I used to call Allah my friend. I said, all oh my friends, remember I went to Catholic school, so I knew about Allah very well. I knew about God very well. I knew religion very well. I always got AIDS in religion. I said, all oh my friends, if you don't show me the right way, I know you're going to punish me. Because I already know. If you're doing wrong, you're going to get punished from the reading the stories in the Bible about nations that got destroyed. I said, if you don't show me the right way, I know you're going to destroy me. I know you're going to punish me. So show me the right way and I will follow. Right after that, I got jumped. And then, this was my first introduction to a Muslim. So I asked him, what are you? He said, I'm a Muslim. My religion is Islam. I said, can you give me something to read? He said, I will. So I went to college because I left the street light because the detectives left a message on my father's phone that if I, if my father doesn't stop me from what I'm doing in the street, I'm going to jail with the rest of the guys. So I left the streets. Everybody that was in that crew, everybody got 10 years or more in jail. I went to college. When I came back on my vacation, I had a girlfriend at that time, and she told me, she said, Suleiman gave me a, um, a Quran. I didn't really know what Quran was. So I said, Okay, how many did he give you? She said, one. I said, where's mine? Because he's supposed to give me one. Because I seen him. He said he was going to give me some literature. Because I was the one interested, uh, interested in Islam. So I said, where's it at? She said, in the closet. I said, okay. You know what I did? I stole it. That's the first thing I've ever stolen in my life. <laughs> I stole it. I took it back to Florida with me. I started reading it. I read it from... Fatiha to Nat or at Nisa, I said, this is what I've been looking for. I said, I want to be a Muslim. So one day I had my uh, this translation of Mina Quran on my, my desk. So one of my friends, he said, yo, he said, what you reading? I said, I'm reading the Quran. He said, I know, I'm a Muslim. I said, Frodo, you ain't no Muslim, you smoke weed and you mess with girls just like we do. You ain't no Muslim. He said, yes, I am. He said, come in my room. His name is Paul Hook. But he's, he's caught up with the street life. He want to play both sides of the, uh, of the fence. So he said, um, come to my room. Show me his prayer rug and some Arabic. Do you know, subhanAllah, that next year I became a Muslim. Me and Farouk left that school. I ended up going to Stony Brook. I transferred to Stony Brook, and he went to Old Westbury. He, his school played in Stony Brook, and we seen each other. I said, Faro, I'm Muslim now. I said, it's time to pray. I joined the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. I said, listen, I'm Muslim now. Won't you come and pray with us? Guess what? He came to pray, but guess who was the Imam of the Salah? I was. He's born Muslim, and I'm leading him to Salah. Allah will switch your place. If you want that street life, Allah will bring someone from the street life and put him in your place. Your parents will love them. And then you will what? Be an outcast because you chose something else. You will get your you will, Allah will switch you. And he will switch you in a minute. Because he doesn't need you. You need to hold on to your Islam. Be like that Muslim slave. You're a Muslim. You are. You have a religion of purity, and leave that life of Najasa, that dirty, filthy street life. Leave it alone. It's nasty. It's disgusting. The same way you wouldn't. You don't want to deal with any uh, feces or urine. The same way with the street life is nasty. Leave it and hold on to this pure religion of Islam. What? Except you have the other. Well, okay, we'll see you there, or we gotta see us.
So each of our brothers will take question and answer. If you have any questions, direct them. Uh, sisters, if you have questions, uh, you can send it down by writing it down. No questions? Any questions? Yes. Oh, the name, you can go online and the name of the book, give me a minute. The name of this book is called Pro-Slavery Interpretations of the Bible, Productive of Infidelity by William Weston Patton. A T T O N, and you will find that story there. This is a book written in 1847. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Of course. Come on. <laughs> no, but you know what? Um, my ancestors were slaves. I even have a picture of one of my uh, second great grandfather was a slave. Yes. Another question over here? Yeah. Why did the people cut his head? Because that's what they do in the streets. Because in the streets, cutting somebody's head is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, you got laughing, it's true. Shooting somebody and stabbing somebody is good. That's street life. Everything. We, because that street, like everything's opposite. Good is bad is good, and good is bad. Just like even in the school, there's certain things that are bad, and they will tell you that is good, and as good that is bad. That's what they're gonna do. Like you in, in America, they tell you Islam is bad. Islam is good, but they make everything opposite. Kulushayin makalul. It's, it's flip flop, it's reverse. Right? <coughs> Any other questions? question? Yes. I gave you the story. I, I became a Muslim because when I was around, when I was young, my my. My cousins used to make fun of me because they were different types of Christian, and it opened my eyes. And I started noticing certain things in the church that was wrong that went against things that I learned in school, like praying to statues and praying to someone who was dead. These things was, I see, wow, this is wrong. And I left these things. And I said, I'm not Christian, but I couldn't tell my parents. So then I started searching. And then I went through, you know, uh, what I mentioned uh when I was up there. No, the question right here. One question about you. What advice would you give, like, either Muslims or Protestants trying to, like, increase the knowledge of their Christians? Because most of them are not going to, like, go out to other countries and Oh, um, it is a blessing that we have the technology. My, I'm doing my studies online. They have the Islamic universities online. Yeah, you have Mishka University, which for me, they, their curriculum is Quran was So they have Islamic universities online. So if you if you want to go online, but uh, uh, what you could start with, there are students of knowledge that are here, and they can teach you, you know, local to Arabi, the Arabic language. They can, you can learn, you know, the uh, rules of uh, Tajweed and stuff like that. And, you know, if you want to, after you learn Arabic, you can join, and then you got Bilal Phillips uh, online program. So you have online um, programs that are available in English and Arabic. I'm doing mine in Arabic. Okay, good. I, I have my own website as well. Go on fathom101.com. 
teach class, I teach as well. So, if the people downstairs are interested, my back to the question is, how can a person study Islam here? Or how can a person who's in high school level age study Islam? He doesn't have the ability to go overseas. I always tell, I always tell the students that if you're not studious on Islamic topics and subjects here, you're not going to be studious to go over there. So the first thing you have to do is, is first and foremost, you have to get a good teacher, a reliable teacher, a credible teacher, and study here. Whether it be via the internet, whether it be you sit with someone in the master, or for, you know, registering some of the classes that you have here, or any other semester, make sure the, the, the knowledge that you're taking is authentic, we turn back to the source of the Kitab, the Quran, the Sunnah, and the according to the understanding of the Sahaba, and you'll be okay, inshallah. Sure. Yes. Yes. I have a question for you. Yes. If you're a Muslim, why did you steal the Quran? I wasn't Muslim yet. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't Muslim yet. And I never stole anything before before my, my life. But I wanted to read it so bad that I took it. <laughs> I was in a rush to go back to school. <laughs> and I wanted it. I was, I was so thirsty for the knowledge. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when we're in that type of situation, you, you're actually wanting from Quran and you want to accept the sun. You don't know if you're going to have the same momentum in two minutes or in two days. So the Quran was developed. I'm not saying that it's a good reason, but still. But, uh, yeah, still but. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Next. Uh, I was like, why did you an when did I become an imam? I became an imam in 1999. Yeah, when did I become an imam in 99? After, after my first trip was studying in Egypt, close to two years. Yes. Yes. Say it again. Oh yeah. Okay. So they man. So mashallah, the the brother who had uh, uh, um uh, influence, well, not well, he played a part in me accepting Islam. His name is Suleiman. Yes. I have a question. I know it's not the state. Why did you go on a trip? I didn't have a thing. We were doing other small things, but um, never a thing, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So he didn't have a bank. Any other questions? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, natural to have relationships with people that you knew for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, not 40 years, 40 years of age yet, but it's natural to have a relationship with certain people. But when you consider them, a, I consider a little friend. My relationship with non-Muslims are not like that. Unless they are, they are a person who is maybe intertwined through, through, um, through blood or through like, uh, marriage. Like my son's, my son's, um, my son's aunt. Quiet, quiet. Was, was, you know, married to my, uh, one, of my, one of my good friends from before his son. Even now, our relationship is not like before, but he still has a different place of me than most of non-Muslims that I never interact with or I don't at all. One of the things that helped me, one of the things that helped me when I accepted Islam was I cut everybody off. When I said to the son, I cut everybody off. And I remember when it happened. Because I used to hang out with non-Muslims. I used to hang out with them. They would be doing drugs. I would hang out. I just wouldn't do the drugs. They'd be with girls. I just didn't, I wouldn't be with girls. I remember walking with some friends to the masjid. They're walking with me out of respect for me and my, my, my new religion. They're walking with me to the masjid. And I'm telling them to, to wait a block away while I go pray. I go pray and come back. 
I go back to the house where, where everyone is hanging out. And it's, I'm literally, I'm literally in one room making sajda, and they're in another room smoking marijuana. So at that point, I knew it. That's not, I couldn't do that. It's not, it just doesn't make sense to me that you can't have a quote. You're going to have to give up on one. And I know I wasn't going to give up on Islam, so I distanced myself from the, from the non Muslims until I was strong enough to actually be able to go around them, show respect, and keep them open if you want to. You know, like, you know. But if you know the hadith of the Jalisu Saleh or Jalisu Su, the good companion and the bad one, just being around them. It's, it's, it's like the the, the the one who is the, sells the mist is going to get on you. And then the one who, the other one who is like the Haddad is going to get on you. So you, they're just associates, they're not friends. Yeah, you're going to have that to tell you when you're older with the Sara, Awliya. You can't, don't take them as friends. Associates, treat them nicely on, on your job, whatever. But as friendship, it's not a good idea because at the end of the day, you are both giving dawah to each other. And one is going to win, like this, this Muslim here, you know, that was in the story. So either he's going to become a Muslim or you're going to go his way. Or you're going to, he's going to take some of your way and you're going to take some of his way. And you lose out more than anything. So, you know, it's best that you leave these individuals alone. Because when I was in college, I, I used to. So I, when I was a new Muslim, I was hanging out with the non-Muslims. It was affecting me. I joined the MSA. I started hanging out with Muslims more, especially my brothers from Bangladesh, you know, Pakistan, you know, and I got, that's what, you know, really close with people from Pakistan and Bangladesh. And, you know, being around them, I said, you know what? I'm not hanging around these non-Muslims. And I completely cut them off. And one thing that really helped me after I got married, you know. Any other questions? Get late. It's nine thirty. Thank you, brothers, for coming tonight. Inshallah, we'll have our guest. We'll have Rashid. Uh, if you want, you can come here. Thank you. Can we have a few seconds from all of you? Just be quiet a little bit.